Hello and welcome to Formula Phil. Welcome, welcome, good friends. Today I am going to be doing a video on a few stories that I picked up over the years about Gilles Villeneuve and, you know, that kind of show what kind of guy he was, because uh, we all know he was a phenomenal driver on the track. He was, he was a total legend off it as well. Now, the first story, and I have to say it's probably my favourite one, and the photos you are seeing now is actually the very car that he used to do this in, this gorgeous Ferrari 308. Gilles lived in Monte Carlo, and of course his workplace at the Ferrari factory was in Maranello, Italy. And that's quite the commute, with distances varying between 430 kilometers or even up to 489 kilometers. It's a pretty far drive anyway. And you can see, well, this is taken from today, so you know, roads would be a, be a bit different and traffic would be a bit less, but you, it's taken, the quickest way is around 4 hours and 50 minutes, so it's nearly a 5 hour journey. And Gilles is supposed to be able to do it in two and a half hours. Two and a half hours! That's incredible speed. Now, forgive my maths, it's not my best subject, let's say, but I'm working out that he's averaging around 180, 190 kilometers an hour. And like, that isn't all Autostrada, or it certainly wasn't, you know, wide open road at the time. And it is said, and this is where the story gets pretty cool, Gilles bet one of his mechanics, or engineers I suppose, and I don't have his name, but uh, he apparently was uh, an avid light aircraft pilot, I suppose. And this engineer said that he could beat Gilles, so there's no way that you can go faster than me in my Cessna 150 or something like that. Now this is where the story gets hazy because I don't know where the airplane was flying from or the airstrip that it was landing in. But you would imagine, you know, as the crow flies, as they say, the flight path would be far more direct than the car journey. I guess this is a Top Gear challenge before, you know, the boys came along. And Gilles was never one to shirk a challenge. So the gauntlet was thrown down. And the engineer set off in his little Cessna and posted an outstanding time of 2 hours and 20 minutes. The engineer was delighted with that time of course, thinking that Gilles could never possibly shave 10 minutes off his best time, which was already outstanding. But later in a week, not to be outdone, Gilles set off at midnight. And I'm sure he was hitting the road in spots. He really must have been flat out practically all the way. And with his friend patiently waiting with a stopwatch at the airfield, Gilles swung in, slid up, and he beat the airplane's time. I don't know by how much, but apparently he did beat the airplane's time. And what makes this funny is that it wasn't that he had somehow bested an airplane, it was that the guy who he was racing commented later that he couldn't fathom or you know, could only imagine that the rules of the road that Gilles broke in his effort to win, and though he did in fact lose to Gilles, he said the thing that hurt him the most was that Gilles' wife, Joan, was in fact asleep in the passenger seat, <laughs> that somehow she had just dropped off through all the madness that he had no doubt pulled. But is it just hearsay? Is it possible? Well, I had a quick look. And I asked a couple of friends who have uh, an interest in aviation, and they reckon it could have happened. Because in fact, if the engineer was using a Cessna 150, the cruising speed of that plane is around 196 kilometers an hour. And of course, that all depends on weather. So yeah, Shield, no doubt, was faster than an aircraft. And speaking of aircraft, Villeneuve took a great interest in helicopters, and he passed his helicopter test, or helicopter license I guess, in three weeks, which is definitely unheard of now, and he was quite the daredevil within it, and he enjoyed to terrify a succession of friends and family, including his then teammate Jody Schechter, and on one occasion Gilles opted to cut the engine to deal with an overheating battery. It was an unorthodox approach, and unappreciated by the South African, who said, but you, Villeneuve, he told him, I will never get back in that goddamn thing with you ever again. On another occasion, he hovered directly outside Nicky Lauda's hotel room until the Austrian woke up, Lauda throwing back the curtains in anger to see Gilles just sitting there hovering, waving at him from the cockpit, and Lauda's room being ten stories up. Lauda commented, of course, he was the craziest devil he ever came across in Formula 1, but he loved him all the more for it. 
And my final Gilles story is uh, from Gordon Kirby, the journalist and who was a great friend of Villeneuve and one of the first people to uh, recognise his talent. And this story harks all the way back to 1976, 1977. This is when Gilles drove in Formula Atlantic, which is, I believe, the cars are kind of between F2 and F3 in specification. Uh, I'm not overly sure, but he drove for March back in those days. And I'm quoting Gordon directly here from uh, his article in Motorsport magazine, which I put the link down below. And he says, I remember the first time we went on track together. We went to Savannah in Georgia to test the new March Atlantic car. Bobby Rahal was going to drive the car first and Gilles was going to try it. Gilles was driving us in a rental car and we arrived at the track and the gate was closed. So I got out, opened it and Gilles pulled the car through and stopped. As I was getting back in the car, he decided he was going to do a tyre burnout. He lit up the rear tyres, up on the rental car, and kept going till one of them burst. There was so much smoke, I couldn't breathe, and I thought, what the hell have I got myself involved in here? Then, about three or four hours later, we were just sitting in the pit road, waiting for our turn with the new car. Gilles and I were sitting in the hire car, just chatting. He had changed the flat rear tyre, and Rahal cruised by, on track, in his own hire car. Well, the conversation immediately stopped. Gilles turned on the ignition and we're off down pit road. He was going to catch Rahal. We were hauling ass down the pit straight. There was almost a 90 degree corner at the end, and I was thinking, he's gonna break. No, he's not gonna break. And he threw the rental car sideways, and I was hanging onto the hand strap on the roof, and my feet were almost in Villeneuve's lap, and we went round this right-hander on two wheels. And I thought, my God, I've never seen car control like this. And he kept going round and round the track like that until some more tire tread flew off and he just had to stop. And that was Gilles. Any opportunity he had, he was going to drive fast. <laughs> and that is classic Gilles. There's nothing like terrifying a journalist, is there? I guess um, that's it for today. They're my favourite Gilles Villeneuve stories. Uh, I hope you enjoyed them. And perhaps, I don't know if you heard them before, but I always think that uh, they certainly broke the mould when they made him. And there's certainly nobody like him in F1 today. Now, it looks like uh, I've got a lot of subscribers in the last couple of days. Uh, thank you so much for you guys who are liking and subscribing and you other legends that are uh, sharing as well. It means a lot. Thank you very much. I got a great suggestion from a subscriber and that is to do an F1's Forgotten Heroes on Stefan Beloff. So I'll get cracking on that. That's a great one. Thank you very much for that. Uh, any other drivers you want to see done, of course, just put them in the comments. Or if you have um, a story or something like that, uh, throw them in the comments as well, please. Thank you very much. I enjoy reading them. And you never know, we could probably collaborate and throw a video together. So... Um, yeah, that, that option is open. So thank you very much. Uh, if you're listening all this way, much love and good.